these mountains where we can go through them. Well, I'd like to introduce uh, David Schrock. He's going to be sharing a word with us this morning. And uh, I've been looking forward to it. And uh, one other thing, you know, we do have a mountain here at our church. <laughs> so, you know, continue to pray that, uh, that we persevere when we go through that mountain. And we have other people that will help us, you know, dig our way through that. So, uh, David. <laughs> and I, the pastor. <laughs> he's the preacher for the, the preacher. couple weeks, yeah. I'll may, maybe make a clarifying comment about that. And uh, David just shared with me that, excuse me, David, you know, he... He wants. He re- likes to be referred to as David, you know, and uh, I like to honor that. And I like when people, are, you know, share that. That uh, I, I say, if I had a, if I would have had a son, I would have named him. Uh, I would have wanted to name him James, but everybody would have called him Jim. <laughs> so I don't know if I would have named him James or not. Uh, but let's pray. Why don't you lift your hand? Re- uh, reach your hands out, and let's pray for our brother here. Father, we pray for brother David as he shares the word that you put in, on his heart for this congregation today, and that. Uh, As you prepared his heart, our hearts will be prepared to hear the word, the word of God, that we want to and we need to live by. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Oh, thank you. All right. Yes, good morning. It's it's good to be here. It's good to meet all of you, most of you. I've I've been able to, uh, to meet Bear with me as I learn names. I, I'm tempted to just snap a picture right now of everyone. It's like I'm going to write names on a, a picture or something, but uh, I'm good at, uh, I'm better at faces than names, but uh, bear with me. So, um, well, yeah, I'll uh, be bringing the messages, uh, yeah, throughout the summer here, and I thought it would be appropriate This morning, I'll just share a little bit about my own personal testimony, where I've come from, so that you know some of who I am, and I'll explain where we'll be going from here. I'm interested in doing a study, just preaching a a series on the book of Nehemiah. So we're going to start that this morning, Uh, but I don't know if we'll get very far, because like I said, I wanted to give some time for uh, just me sharing a little bit about, about who I am and how God has worked in my life. And so I am a uh, teacher at Ephrata Mennonite School. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with that, but it's just north of Ephrata. Uh, occasionally we have made the, uh, the news because we're building a new, uh, a new facility, and it's a big, big project. Maybe that's why I'm preaching through Nehemiah. We're currently building walls at Ephrata Mennonite School, new walls for our new school. I didn't think about that until just now. Uh, obviously, the, the question that everyone asks after I say I'm a teacher is, well, what, what do you teach? And I never know quite how to answer that because I, uh, I guess you could say I'm a jack of all trades and master of none, uh, that I don't have expertise in just one area, but I teach mostly in the uh, upper level math and some science and psychology and history. Uh, so it's a bit all over the place, but mostly in the high school, I've occasionally taught some middle school classes, that school is K through 12. We like to say we're the largest conservative Mennonite school in the world. I think that's true, but that, maybe that doesn't say a whole lot. Lindsay, my wife back there, teaches German at McCaskey in Lancaster City. We joke that that's the polar opposite of Ephrata Mennonite School. Uh, McCaskey, that's, uh, yeah, it's definitely a different culture. We joke that we're going to do a, uh, uh, an exchange student program someday where some of my students go to McCaskey and some of McCaskey students come to Ephrata Mennonite. Uh, she teaches German there. She had taught Spanish within the school district of Lancaster for a number of years, for about five years, uh, elementary school Spanish. Uh, And then that program, uh, they cut the elementary school Spanish program and then just so happened, and looking back, this doesn't feel like it was quite, coincidence doesn't seem like the right word. The German teacher was retiring at that exact time, that, uh, that year that the Spanish program ended, and so Lindsay who speaks German, was able to uh, step into the German uh, instructor role in the high school. Uh, And yeah, we have two children, Joseph and Naomi. uh, And Joseph is missing. I assume he's around. He went downstairs. All right, he's good. Um, So so a little bit of my background, just personal details of where I've come from and and also my faith journey. I did grow up in Lancaster County, uh, but I grew up more in southern Lancaster County, which kind of is a different Lancaster County. In northern Lancaster County, if you're 
if we're aware of it or not, the culture is thick up here, as Carl Horning once said. And uh, yeah, so Southern Lancaster County. Uh, I, around the Millersville, New Danville, Conestoga area, if you can picture that area, Lindsay, a little further south than that yet, uh, between uh, Willow Street and the Buck, the uh, burgeoning metropolis of Smithville, uh, if you know where that is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I grew up uh, going to New Danville Mennonite Church. And looking back over my, my faith journey, I grew up in a, a house where we went to church every week, and I think that, uh, that I always sensed that that faith was my own. Um, as I reflect on my, yeah, my faith, I don't have a specific moment that I can say that I, here's the day that I said I am a follower of Jesus some people have that, and that's a wonderful testimony. Um, I don't, and that's just, that is part of my story, and maybe some of you resonate with that, that it wasn't a specific instance where you, uh, you said, now is the moment when I, when I follow Jesus. Uh, there isn't just one type of testimony and one type of faith experience, and we have to be honest with what ours is. I was baptized around the age of 13. There's a baptismal class at my church, and I, I went through that uh, to make a public uh, confession of my faith, uh, and I think I, I did own my faith at that point. I, I think I can honestly say that, but I would say throughout high school, uh, I went through seasons of, of wrestling with faith, and then I would say my junior and senior year of high school, I went to LMH. Lindsay and I both did, actually. That's where we met, Lancaster Mennonite High School. Uh, junior and senior year especially, I would say that that was a season of making my faith my own. If I could redo my life, maybe my baptism would happen then, uh, but I don't think there's anything wrong with how my life unfolded in that respect. So junior and senior year, there was a Bible study, uh, a student-led Bible study that would happen Friday mornings at LMH. It was, it was all student-organized. We would meet before school early in the morning. I remember driving there in the dark in the winter. Uh, and it grew to be about uh, 7,500 people some mornings. Uh, it was almost like a, a church service that so we had students there. Uh, it was an exciting time. And it was a time that, like I said, my faith uh, became something of my own. I uh, involved in some, some kind of leadership there in that Bible study. And uh, that was, I have good memories of that uh, when you really kind of step out and, and claim faith as your own. I worked at Black Rock Retreat, Black Rock Camp, as a camp counselor uh, at the end of high school and in through uh, some years of college, uh, my summers. I was a camp counselor there, and I look back on that as another season of stepping out and, and maturing in my faith uh, in ways that, uh, yeah, stepping out in ways that I hadn't before, interacting with young people and teaching, teaching them about, uh, about faith and about Bible, the Bible and about God. I went to Eastern Mennonite University in Harrisonburg, Virginia. That's uh, Lindsay and I, again, we, we both went there. We started dating in high school, and we dated for five and a half years, four and a half. So anyway, finally, our senior year of college, uh, so well, let's just get married. All right, so we got married partway through our senior year. Uh, and yeah, EMU, Eastern Mennonite University, I studied psychology and biblical studies there. Uh, so that was my, my programs that I studied. And I'd had a good experience at LMH as far as uh, I felt like a community where my faith was supported. Uh, EMU, uh, was, uh, they are very conscious of their faith, but it was a very different faith uh, than what I had known at LMH. Uh, where the emphasis was uh, kind of a social justice kind of gospel. And there were elements of that that I think uh, are not entirely wrong, but uh, also I had to wrestle with what, of what I'm being taught in my Bible classes and what I'm hearing in, in the chapel services here. What of that do I believe? And again, a process of growing and wrestling and, and internalizing and making faith my own. Uh, and so... 
After graduating, we moved back up to Lancaster. Lindsay started teaching at that point at uh, McCaskey, or at, uh, in School District of Lancaster at that point. McCaskey is the high school, and then the district is School District of Lancaster. And I spent a year at that point as a counselor at Philhaven in Mount Gretna, which is not terribly far from here, and worked in the residential treatment program at that point. Uh, so that was adolescent males who are basically have enough kind of difficulty functioning in their home and school settings that they have to live in a residential facility. Uh, that was a, a challenging year, uh, as you can probably imagine. Uh, challenging situations won't tell any stories right now, but maybe some stories will come up in my, my sermons, I don't know, of uh, working with young people who had very, very serious challenges in their lives. Uh, after about a year of that, uh, someone, an acquaintance of, of ours, uh, a friend of Lindsay's actually, who had taught at Effort of Mennonite for a year, decided she was moving on elsewhere, and she gave us a call and said, would David enjoy teaching there? I, I think uh, he might be a good fit. I said, sure, I'll give that a try. So I started teaching at Effort of Mennonite. Uh, that was about 14 years ago now. And I have had a kind of a professional journey that's actually taken me away from there a couple times. Uh, some further schooling that I did required that I, I had to uh, leave Effort of Mennonite a, a few times uh, to focus on schooling. And also, uh, I did a stint as the director of the Hans Herr House. It's a museum uh, in the Willow Street area. Being a teacher, I had the time over the summer to volunteer there, and I really, I really like history. I get excited about history, and not everyone can quite identify with that, but I thought it was thrilling to be able to, yeah, to give tours, and it's a house that's 300 years old, 1719, oldest surviving structure in Lancaster County. I thought that was fun, and I would volunteer there over the summers, and was asked to be the interim director uh, over one summer, and then asked to be the the director after that, I thought that was a fun opportunity. So I did that for a few years, uh, but then ultimately decided to, to go back into teaching after doing that for some time. And so that's where I am today. Uh, but the fact that Lindsay and I have both been teachers for our adult lives means that over the summers we've had, yeah, time to do some interesting things, some interesting opportunities, and go on some adventures that uh, maybe I'll tell you about some other time. But our, um, yeah, I describe our lives as having a, uh, not necessarily balance, we like to think of balance, uh, you know, work and family and church and all these things, and our, our lives don't always feel like they have balance because the school year is hectic, and especially when the end of the marking period is coming up, end of the semester, uh, but then the summer comes, and I like to say that teaching has a great rhythm to it. It doesn't have balance, but it has rhythm, uh, and so our lives have that rhythm of working hard during the, uh, the school year and then, then time over the summer. So that time gives me a, an opportunity now to, to be here. Uh, and I, we, yeah, we have been attending herbs not far from here, just on the other side of Mannheim, for about 14 years or so. And uh, I've yeah, for, for reasons that I, I'm still not even entirely sure how this came to be, but I would uh, I usually have preached there three or four times a year, and that's, I've never been ordained as a, as a minister there or anything like that. I've served on a leadership team, uh, but I've, uh, they've always called on me to just preach occasionally, um, but never every Sunday. And so, yeah, it just so happened. But again, coincidence probably isn't the right word that my schedule opened up a time when, when this congregation uh, has, has a need. And so I'm excited about preaching here, and I anticipate this as an opportunity to grow in a, an area that I've had some experience in, but uh, not a lot. You don't have a seasoned preacher standing in front of you, but I'll get a little more seasoning here this summer. And I do expect that uh, I, I see myself as filling the role of uh, preaching uh, but And maybe some of this has been said already. Uh, Paul and I had a good conversation the other week that um, I don't see my role here over the summer as a, a pastoral role necessarily, uh, but uh, sort of a, a placeholder 
to, to allow the, the, yeah, gathering to uh, take place, uh, teaching the word over the summer here as the congregation looks at what, uh, what the future holds uh, and, uh, and maps out a, a plan and explores what that could look like. I, uh, I do want to also just say in terms of demographic details, or not so much demographic details here, but in terms of my own uh, personal faith journey, I do have a uh, I guess a perspective on faith and, and the Bible that I would say is a, an Anabaptist Mennonite perspective. Uh, and I think that it's healthy for us to be honest about that. I feel like some congregations, it's easy for congregations and individuals to either err on the side of being very dogmatic about, I am this kind of Baptist or this kind of Methodist or this kind of Mennonite, and here are the exact specifics that I believe, and I want to convince you of that. Uh, you, can, you can err on that side. But then there are some congregations that err on the side of, well, we don't really, we won't tell you exactly what we believe. We just believe the Bible. Well, all churches say that. I think there's some value in being honest about what your theology and perspective is. And so that's, some, that's kind of my perspective and background. Uh, but uh, I, I don't view my role here as, uh, my, my job isn't to make a, a good solid Mennonite out of each of you. If you want to know what Mennonites uh, believe and what I think that looks like, then I'm happy to talk to you about that. Uh, but I want to encourage you in your faith in this season of the congregation right now, and I'm excited for the opportunity to do it. You'll have to pardon me. I just have a bit of a stuffy nose here this morning, so turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah while I just... Uh, maybe you can turn the mic off. <laughs> All right, Nehemiah. I want to, want to study this book with you a little bit here. I, I like having a kind of a sermon series. I like that idea. That's the way that we often do it at Herbs, not that that's the right way, the only way. Uh, we often preach kind of expository through a, uh, through a text. I think the longest that we ever did was the book of John. And by the time the book of John was done, we were ready for something other than the book of John. That took over a year to, uh, to get through. Uh, Nehemiah is a short enough book that I think we can do it. I haven't exactly mapped it out yet, uh, exactly how I want to divide it up. Uh, some of it will, will take it a bit as it comes, but I like, to, I like to have it mapped out. There are some chapters which we'll be able to go through pretty quickly because some of the some of the text in Nehemiah is sections of names and numbers and all that, which there's value in that, but we can go through some of those sections fairly quickly. But the story of Nehemiah is one that I love, uh, and I think there's a lot in there, a lot of value in this story as it unfolds for, uh, for us. And so I invite you to explore it with me. And I'd say I'd recommend, uh, you can read it. It's, it's not too hard to read in one sitting. It's 13 chapters, so it can be done in one sitting or break it up throughout the week. Uh, but I'd recommend just reading through it. And you can, you can read through it maybe as we go, but even reading through it uh, before we dive in and make it the whole way through, you can make it uh, a goal this week if you'd like to read through the book of Nehemiah. So in case you're still flipping around for Nehemiah, it... Uh, so it's on page 437. Just kidding. It is in my Bible. After Ezra, interestingly enough, it is uh, the last history book chronologically in the Old Testament. And so this, uh, I, I kind of wish that the Old Testament were ordered more chronologically, uh, but uh, it's, yeah, Esther is placed after the book of Nehemiah, but it actually takes place before Nehemiah. And some of the prophets, uh, look at Malachi at the very end there, that would ha that's a prophet that would be around the same time as Nehemiah. Uh, but in terms of the history books, the kind of your first and second chronicles, Samuel, some of those books, uh, Nehemiah is the last history book that we have before the Gospel of Matthew picks it up again in the New Testament. And so in some ways, this is a book of looking back and also looking ahead, Nehemiah, it's, uh, the Jews have been in exile for some time. Some have returned to Jerusalem, and Nehemiah is tasked, he senses the task of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And so he reflects on what was, what Jerusalem had been, and looks ahead towards, he has a vision for what can be. 
And so that's a broad story arc that I want us to be mindful of as we, as we look at this. So give a little bit of uh, historical background here to set the stage, and then we'll get a little bit into, into chapter one uh, before, we, before we wrap up today. The Jews had been in captivity in Babylon, trusting you know some of this Old Testament history, but a little review doesn't hurt. Uh, around 600 B.C., is when a lot of there were a few different waves that they, they went into uh, together, but that would be roughly uh, Jews taken away to Babylon. Uh, and then the Babylon, uh, yeah, Babylon, the Babylonians, that empire falls to the Persians, who became the next world superpower. And you can see throughout how that story takes place God's hand at work. Uh, something that I believe is valuable for us to see as we look at events like this in the Old Testament is God at work in the lives of nations. He's at work in the lives of individuals. He puts something in the heart of Nehemiah, a specific task to do. Uh, God is also in the work, uh, at work in the hearts of kings, of entire nations, of people groups. And so God is a God who is both intensely personal but also a universal God uh, who has all of these things, all these world events that we look at and we think they're out of control and incredibly complex and really cause us anxiety when we read the newspaper. That is all within God's control. We see God at work uh, in things that might not appear to be necessarily God's hand. They turn out to be God's hand. We see it in the Old Testament. That's a theme that we'll see here. The book of Ezra, immediately preceding Nehemiah, it covers the time period uh, about 539 to 457. Uh, and so it's, uh, Ezra basically takes place up until the time of Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah picks up about 10 or 15 years after the book of Ezra leaves off. So Ezra is the story of uh, some of the Jews returning to Jerusalem and some of the restoration of the temple so that they can have worship there. And so that has taken place, but the work remains unfinished, uh, especially with the, uh, the city walls there, which we'll be we'll be talking about briefly in just a bit. The, as we look at this, Nehemiah, it is important for us to remember that timeline because I think I spent a lot of my life knowing that, well, okay, the Jews went into exile, and then they came back. Uh, if, but if you look at the dates, how this, uh, the, the time periods over which this takes place, you realize that the people, Nehemiah and all the people of his generation were people who had never lived in Jerusalem. Uh, it would have been their great, great grandparents. This is the time, uh, say, between our time today and the Civil War, would be roughly the time between Nehemiah and the original exile into Babylon. And so we can't think that Nehemiah is longing to go back to Jerusalem from his uh, position that he has in Persia uh, because he remembers being there as a young person and desires to, uh, to uh, see it again. He's never been there as far as we know. And so that's fascinating to me, that, but that, uh, that's still in his heart, this desire for, uh, to see Jerusalem as he was told that it once was long before he was born. We don't know much about Nehemiah's background. Uh, verse 1 here says that he was the son of Hakaliah. Really don't know anything about him that I'm aware of. Uh, and he is the cupbearer to the king. He puts in that detail. This is autobiographical. It appears that Nehemiah wrote the book of Nehemiah. He writes it in first person. He puts that detail in at the very end of chapter one, but it's worth just putting as, in here as we begin. He was a cupbearer to the king, and so that's simply he would taste the wine before the, uh, the king drank it and kind of uh, serve, serve that to him. And we can conjecture from this, it's uh, maybe connecting a few dots, but we can conjecture that because of this, Nehemiah is probably has shown himself to be a very competent individual. You probably know some people who are like this, that just whatever they set their hand to, they're successful at. Uh, they just have good judgment and good wisdom and are able to apply what they know in various situations. And I think we see that in Nehemiah. I'm just going to read briefly, you don't have to turn there, uh, but from Daniel. Daniel, we probably see something similar where we see these uh, young Hebrew men. 
maybe even boys, uh, in the service of the king in Daniel chapter 1. It just gives a description of the kind of people that the king chose. Pardon me as I flip there. Chapter 1 of Daniel, verse 4, youths without blemish. Uh, yeah, the king connect, uh, commanded Ashpenaz uh, to uh, find youths without blemish of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them literature and the language of the Chaldeans. And so that's a description. And that would probably apply to Nehemiah. That if the king is choosing people to be in that role, a person such as cupbearer, he'd choose someone who is, uh, who's intelligent and able to kind of learn how to behave in the uh, king's court and all these things. And so again, connecting a few of the dots, just uh, making a few conjectures there of who he would have been, the kind of person he would have been, uh, but that's who we are working with here in Nehemiah. Some themes that I want us to be mindful of as we look through here. Uh, so Nehemiah senses in his heart uh, a desire put there by God to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, and... In, uh, it's easy for us, perhaps, to not appreciate the role of walls because Mannheim never had walls. Lancaster City never had walls. Philadelphia never even had walls, and that's an even older city still. Uh, but if you go back further, if you look at uh, maps of European cities, pick a, a large European city, and you can do this now easily, thanks to Google. Uh, you look at the aerial view, you know, a satellite view, uh, and you can see usually in an old city in Europe an outline. You can usually see it just based on how the streets are kind of arranged and things. You can kind of see the outline of where the city walls would have been around that city because that was, that was crucial. Your little villages didn't have walls, uh, but if it was a city of any significance, it had to have walls. You couldn't have anything valuable in the city without these walls uh, because uh, it would be vulnerable to attack and be too easy of a target for, for opposing peoples and nations. Uh, and so, in the time of Ezra, we have the attempt to restore the temple, but without walls, you cannot have the kind of valuables in the temple that, uh, that God had prescribed. Uh, and you can't have prosperity within the city until you have these walls. Lindsay and I have spent a little bit of time in Vienna. Lindsay was at one point a student at the University of Vienna, Vienna, Austria. And you can go to uh, one part of the city. I should have asked you about this, Lindsay, to clarify my memory of this, but there are there's a place where you can see where the walls used to be in Vienna. Vienna is an ancient city. Uh, well over a thousand years old. And, you can, yeah, they've, they've kind of excavated this, and there's one place where you can see where it's kind of on display, you know. And here's where the wall started, and then I think it's about 30 or 40 feet away is where the wall ended. Not the length of the wall, the depth of the wall. 30 feet deep, massive walls. And you can go and you can see it, uh, like the foundation of the wall in this one area, it's, it's kept there. Uh, and Vienna ended up uh, playing a major role in history because the Ottomans attacked Vienna twice and, and never succeeded in getting past Vienna uh, as they had their eyes on, on Europe. But anyway, walls. So Nehemiah knows that for Jerusalem to be the city that it once was, uh, he's got to get the walls built. And... There's meaning in that for us, I believe. Walls, you can use walls to symbolize a lot of things, but walls, we need walls in our lives. Uh, we need protection from sin, from the attacks of the enemy. Our families need walls. Our churches need walls. And I don't mean that in a way that I want you to understand us to be exclusive. It's hard for people to get in here. But I think you understand uh, that the church... Uh, as, a, as a body, our families, we as individuals, we are under attack. Uh, there's spiritual attack. Uh, there's all kinds of doctrine that wants to get into the church to start to undermine true doctrine. 
Uh, there are wolves in, in sheep's clothing. There are, uh, yeah, the enemy wants to bring a lot of things into the church. That's so appropriate to have a defense against that. And sometimes we let the walls of our lives, the walls of our churches fall into ruin. Uh, that we, we start to, uh, there's, there's a, a gap there that sin can come in and that gap widens. Uh, and a gap over there in, in the church that we, well, we, we allow this uh, in the church when maybe God would say we shouldn't. And so to be conscious of that and we need to periodically, again, in our lives, personal lives, in our families, in our churches, uh, mend those walls, rebuild those walls, think about how to protect ourselves spiritually. So that's one theme here in Nehemiah, the theme of walls. Another theme that I see is, uh, and I mentioned this before, uh, Nehemiah both has a vision, uh, has an idea of what was and also what can be. And he finds himself in a place of despair, uh, looking at what used to be the Jerusalem that he would have known from Solomon's time, the temple, the wealth, the prosperity, the security that was there. It must have been painful for him to compare that to his situation uh, in the present. But he doesn't just look back, he looks forward as a vision for what could be. And he carefully discerns the will of God. He doesn't just move hastily, but once he has discerned the will of God, he moves forward confidently. That's a model for all of us, so we'll unpack that as we go. And uh, Nehemiah... The, uh, the, the third theme that I've listed here just as a theme to look for as we begin is that of leadership. And God, I believe, calls us all to be leaders in some way or another. Many people would say, I'm not a leader. Uh, other people are leadership. I'm not a leader. Uh, but I do believe that God has called all of us in some capacity or another to be leaders. And Nehemiah, what we see in him is the ability to mobilize people. He's not an engineer. He doesn't, I don't think he knows much about building walls, honestly. And yet he's able to get the job done because he's able to find the people to do it. And isn't that a great picture of the church? And in the church, you don't have one person who can do everything, you, but you often do need someone to mobilize the people who can do things. Nehemiah's a great picture of that. Uh, that he himself, not an expert in everything, but he knows how to find the people to get the job done. And that's often how God works. God works through people like that. Uh, in his church and in other settings. And Nehemiah, if you know the story of Nehemiah, another theme that runs through it is constant criticism. Sanballat is the name that uh, the, the, his biggest critic, someone who is just constantly threatening him, discouraging him, and, uh, and actually yeah, threatening violence against him. And he's able to handle that criticism uh, and discouragement, knowing he knows how to handle that and still move forward. And so a model of a good leader in that way, and I think we can all learn something from that. So let's just take a moment. We won't go very deep into it. We'll be picking it up next week, but I want to just start to look in chapter one, these first few verses here at least, uh, to, to get us started before we, we dive in a little deeper next week. Verse one of chapter one in Nehemiah. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. We'll stop there. Chislev, uh, that is the, uh, it would correspond roughly with November, December for us. That'll actually come into play later, but tuck that in your mind, that little detail there. And it says the 20th uh, year, I'm reading out of the ESV for what that's worth, so I don't know if you have a, you probably have a different translation or you very well might. Uh, but anyway, uh, 20th year, that would be of King Artaxerxes, who is the king that he's interacting with here as the story unfolds. And then verse 2, Hanani, apparently a little literal brother. Uh, when we read it here, uh, Hanani, one of my brothers, you wonder, is that actually a brother of his or is it uh, just a fellow uh, Israelite, a fellow Jew? It appears, based on some later texts, that that is actually a uh, brother of his uh, uh, in his family. And then, uh, going on here, I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, in verse 2, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. 
Nehemiah, as we will see in chapter 1, he is the cupbearer to the king. Uh, I believe that he was in a very comfortable position. Uh, He was probably living in a palace, had all of his needs met, I I assume. He was probably educated, uh, and yet his heart is not set on that. Uh, His heart is towards Jerusalem, that place he had never been. Uh, the place perhaps he had, he had never, uh, never seen, certainly never lived there. And so, looking at this time period, a uh, large number of Jews, probably three million or so, went into exile, in the original exile. Only about 50,000 returned. That's, uh, that's only about 2%, maybe even less than 2%. Most of the Jews, the vast majority of them, that were taken into exile... Uh, after several decades of very harsh treatment, the treatment was less harsh, and they began to get comfortable and settle into that culture. Uh, And they never went back. They simply became kind of absorbed into both the culture and the religion of those around them. That was the experience of a vast majority of Jews who went into exile. And it would have been easy for Nehemiah to just be one of those people would have been easy for him in the setting of the palace and the king's court to adopt the religion of those people, uh, to simply adopt that culture and just to more or less forget about uh, God's people and about God himself. But you can see his heart is for the, uh, the city of Jerusalem and people there, even though they're geographically uh, separated from him. Verse 3. Uh, it says that the remnant there is in great trouble and shame. So uh, Zerubbabel earlier in the book of Ezra talks about this, and Ezra himself helped to, helped to orchestrate some to return. There are people living there, uh, but they're, they're defenseless. They're living in trouble and shame. And something that I see here, and it's maybe one final lesson. I'm looking at the clock, and I'm sensing that maybe I should wrap up here shortly. Uh, but... Just a few, a few final comments uh, that Nehemiah, uh, he, he learns about the needs of the Jews there, uh, and he senses that his call to uh, rebuild the walls there. And Zerubbabel had done some fantastic work. Ezra had uh, done some great work in being a leader and bringing people back. Uh, but the task of restoring all of this uh, Jerusalem back to what it would have been was something that spanned generations. Sometimes God has tasks for us uh, that we don't see the whole thing through ourselves, but a big task that even our whole life only takes, uh, only we only um, complete a part of a bigger task that God has for us. And that's what we see for Nehemiah. And in verse four, we'll end here. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. He's weeping over Jerusalem. If that sounds familiar, we see something similar perhaps in uh, in Luke 19, the triumphal entry. Jesus crests the hill and sees, he can look down and see Jerusalem. And the Bible says that he wept. He wept over Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah, such concern for this city that he is weeping for these people and for this city. The uh, book of Psalms, in Psalm 137, uh, God says, If I forget you, Jerusalem, if I ever forget you, uh, may my right hand forget its skill, may my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. Uh, God making an oath, he will never forget Jerusalem. And that's Nehemiah's heart too. It would have been so easy for Nehemiah's heart to be elsewhere, but Nehemiah's heart resonated with the heart of God uh, that he was so in tune there. We also may sometimes feel a bit of what Nehemiah felt when we hear about someone that we care about who maybe at one time had those spiritual walls around them, but those walls are in ruin. Have you ever felt that, where you've known someone that you cared about deeply, or a congregation, a church, that has, you felt like, uh, forsaken the truth, forsaken God? I think it's right to feel a sense of mourning over that. 
And if you haven't felt that, uh, perhaps you can uh, ask God to, to give you some of that sorrow for the spiritual ruin that we see around us. And especially, as I said, in those who once perhaps had that faith, but their faith is, is uh, in a, a season of ruin, that we mourn for that, that that pulls on our heart and we desire to do something, some kind of action uh, to, uh, to bring that person back. That is Nehemiah's heart that we will see as we go through here. I'm looking forward to exploring this with you. As I said, uh, please read through Nehemiah. We'll uh, start next week with his prayer. Uh, he prays 12 times throughout the book. He is a, a man of prayer. And we see it's recorded uh, throughout his writing here about his own experience. And so we'll study his prayer next week and probably get into chapter 2 where he interacts with the, uh, the king and humbly requests what God has, has laid on his heart, uh, which was a major risk for, uh, for Nehemiah to say that before the king. We'll explore that next week. Uh, let's go ahead and, uh, and close in prayer. Let me, let me step into what this congregation is used to, Paul. I meant to ask before the uh, service. Is there usually a song after the, uh, after the sermon, or would this be uh, the close here? I'm going to say something about Paul. All right. Sounds good. All right. Very good. I will close the sermon and then turn it over to Paul. Dear God, we, uh, we thank you for the example of Nehemiah. We thank you for even those around us who are competent people who show that leadership, the initiative, the ability to see projects through. And God, if you've laid a task on our heart, perhaps uh, something that we feel uh, your spirit prompting us to move forward with, but we're not sure. It seems like a big task. We feel like we might receive criticism or discouragement from those around us. I pray that we can be keen to discern your will. We can have a sense of your spirit that our heart can be in the same place as yours. And that you'll lead us to perhaps take action uh, as Nehemiah did on a uh, project uh, that uh, would otherwise be impossible without, without your blessing and help. So I pray that each of us can uh, take that with us this week. Give us a burden for those in spiritual ruin around us, that we can weep, we can feel that mourning uh, for those uh, whose, uh, whose spiritual walls lie in ruin and who are in a vulnerable state. Uh, ask your blessing on uh, each person here as we'll be going about our week and going from this place shortly. Uh, that we can be uh, carriers of your spirit and a light to those around us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, David. I really appreciate that. And, uh, when I first when I started preaching that, I know that's for our church. I'm sure, you know, we've had some walls broken down and some things happen, obviously here. And I had to ask I, myself. I said, "Well, am I a Zerubbabel? Am I an Ezra? Or am I a Nehemiah?" <laughs> so I have to, I can't don't have an answer to that question, but it is a question, and uh, <clears throat> you know, we need vision and uh, God works in people nations, and the kings. So I'm looking forward to next week, what you're going to share with us. And also, today being Father's Day, we have a gift for all the fathers. So fathers, you want to stand up? And uh, I'll walk around and and then I'll pray. I hope you all like coffee, because these were bought before my time. (laughs) worth of them. <laughs> so these are for Starbucks for coffee. And uh, here you go, Sam, you can have one too. I'm sure you father of guys. Is there another is there anybody else here, Pauline? <laughs> are you at you Okay, just asking. <laughs> Just asking. (laughs) Uh. 
And I'll have a benediction, and we'll close. Father, I, um, how you've been an example for us to be fathers, how we need to love our children, love one another, to be providers for those families. And uh, Father, as, as we are fathers, as we have found out in our life, um, Kay and I, that oftentimes we are the only thing between the world and our children. And no matter what they do, we love them. They are part of our lives. And just like um, as children of God, we are always children of God, and he will always love us. So I thank you for that in Jesus' name. And uh, <clears throat> closing today, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, for now and evermore. Amen. All right, so let's go. Love one another, those around us. Amen.